I think a Tolton shows us how to handle disappointment in life. Augustus's mother, Martha Jane, was already given away as a wedding gift. The denunciation, the negation of the Black experience, particularly the Black man, did not bode well for family life. Slavery lasted 400 some years. Then it didn't end. England ended their enslavement of peoples in 1807. But for us, it continued. It morphed into segregation and discrimination, where the Black man was again denied his dignity. We in our country have been practicing social distancing amongst the races for an awful long time. And to make sure that social distance was maintained between white and black and American society, uh, we criminalized the black man. And that's in every institution, society, church, politics, you name it. everyone. I'm Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse, founder and president of the Ruth Institute. Welcome to today's episode of the Dr. J Show. My guest today is Bishop Joseph Perry, who is the auxiliary bishop, one of the auxiliary bishops, I should say, of the Archdiocese of Chicago. And I've asked him to join us today because he is promoting the cause of Father Augustus Tolton for sainthood within the Catholic Church. During Black History Month, I thought it would be very interesting to hear from Bishop Perry about Father Augustus Tolton and the process of canonization. Bishop Perry, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the invitation and the interest in uh, this touching story. Yes, yes, yes. So, so um, you're working to have Father Augustus Tolton canonized, and I suspect that most of our Ruth Institute listeners don't really know much about Father Tolton, and many of our Ruth Institute followers are not Catholic at all, so they don't know about the canonization process either. So why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about the story of his life? Sure. Well, history uh, dubs him as the first priest of African descent to work in the United States, as far as we can go back. Uh -huh. He is the very, very first. Uh, he is the descendant of enslaved people from a farm in uh, Northeast Missouri, Rawls County, a place that you can visit. Many tourists go there. Augustus himself was born on the 1st of April of 1854. And during the chaos that erupted with the outbreak of the war, uh, slaves were running along routes of the secret passageways of the Underground Railroad. Augustus's father had already escaped his owner to join up with uh, black men who were enrolling on the Union side, uh, thanks to appeals made by uh, Frederick Douglass to Abraham Lincoln to allow blacks to uh, join the Union cause. After a couple of years and not knowing the fate of her husband, Augustus's mother, Martha Jane, began plotting an escape uh, from the family that owned her and her children, the Elliots. Uh, following the death of her master, a man by the name of Stephen Elliot, somewhere between, we figure, July and September of 1863, uh, she left quietly in the night with three children, one a babe in arms. Wow. At one point along the 43-mile journey on foot, she was accosted by Confederate bounty hunters who were awarded handsomely in those days for catching runaways. But miraculously, a group of uh, Union troops had descended upon the scene and reminded the bounty hunters that they were standing or happened to be standing on Union soil and had to give Martha Jane up to their custody. So the men in blue then took her to the shore of the Mississippi River, where was found a rowboat, a dilapidated rowboat with one oar. And the soldiers directed her to get in the boat with their children and cross to the other side where she would find freedom. Wow. She loads her children into the boat 
began roaring in the night's rather strong river current. And the Confederates had not given up, though. <laughs> they began shooting at her with their <gasps> muskets. And how old were these children, Father? Remind us, how old were these three children? Well, Augustus was nine years of age. Uh -huh. And there was a sister who was a year or two younger, and then there was a babe in arms. Wow. So it appears to wow. have been a boy. Wow. And so she's rowing with a baby? Or yes. maybe maybe a little Augustus is helping row or something? It was oh only my one god. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Miraculously, she made it to the other side. And upon arriving on the Illinois shore, uh, she knelt on the ground and took her children in her arms. And she told them, uh, children, never, ever forget the goodness of the Lord. Wow. And wow. once arrived at Quincy, Illinois, uh, about a, an additional 20 or 23 mile distance from the shore, the Totons had to navigate the choppy waters of racial acceptance in a town that was part pro-slavery in sentiment and part abolitionist in sentiment. And it proved difficult getting her children an education in the town school due to this social scene. And this is in Quincy. This is Quincy, Illinois, you're talking Quincy, about Illinois. now. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yet growing up as a lad and into his teenage years, um, Augustus uh, seems to have exhibited a rather sensitive and religious tone about him. Uh, some nuns and priests came to his rescue to tutor him with his studies as several schools expelled him for being either black or lacking education on the level of his peers or due to the fact that he had to work in the local tobacco factory and other jobs to help his mother support the family. This is a poor section of Quincy a town where blacks somehow hovelled. But these uh, visionary priests and nuns who tutored him in between thought Tolton perhaps could be a priest someday to help improve his people's situation post-Civil War that left many blacks aimless and haphazardly accepted by society. Once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, in 1863, uh, the year of Augustus's ninth birthday, um, there was no program of assimilation of freed slaves into broader society. People who had been mired, obviously, in poverty and illiteracy for 200 years so far. And seminaries uh, did not receive Black students in those days. So a group of um, friars working in Quincy managed to arrange to have him attend a seminary in Rome. So wait a minute, before we go there, when did the family become Catholic? The family became Catholic during their time of enslavement because the Eliots were Catholic. I see. Okay, so this pre, their, their Catholicism predates these acts of kindness exactly. uh, by the clergy. They were already, and so when she said to the children when they landed in Illinois, she, she was a Catholic. She was speaking as a Catholic mother yes, to, her, to her children. Okay, uh, yeah. And the Eliots and many other Catholic and even Protestant slave masters had their, their indentured servants baptized in their own religion, at least mm -hmm. not that far. Right, right. So when they sent him over to Rome, uh, he uh, was, was required to study for about six years until his ordination with his class on the 24th of April, 1886. This was the day before Easter. He was assigned to go Africa to go to Africa as a missionary because the authorities felt he could not be a success in this country given the apartheid that was so routine here. Mm -hmm. However, the night before his ordination, a cardinal prefect of the uh, Propaganda Fide department where he was studying told Tolton that he changed his mind. He reversed the decision of sending him to Africa. It was in fact sending him back to his own home, to be a missionary amongst his own people. And as quoted in his biography, the Cardinal is stated to have said, <clears throat> you know, the United States considers itself to be the most enlightened nation on the face of the earth. And if that's true, they should be able to accept a black priest. 
So we're going to send you back home amongst your own people. And unbeknownst to the Cardinal, he was really fashioning the cross upon which Tolton would be uh, nailed. He met up with partial acceptance by many people in Quincy, but also some scant looks and whispers and exaggerated reports of others who were either jealous of his success with both whites and blacks in his ministry, others who felt he should stick working with blacks alone. Mm -hmm. uh, this while white people voluntarily and sometimes in secret sought him out for his priestly ministry. That's very interesting. It, that, <clears throat> um, it, and it seems to me, I, I read in this book, um, which people might want to consult, this, a very nice biography of, that um, he was very successful as a preacher. Is, is that, right? Is that mm -hmm. right? And so people were coming to him. And so naturally, other priests were jealous. Mm -hmm. yes. right? he, yeah. he was something of a news sensation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll bet. Yes. So Tolton uh, was kind of caught in a quandary that was against his own grain, his own makeup. Right. On the one hand, he was a priest in theory, ordained to minister to everyone. But practically speaking, the social demarcation of race ordered for society prevented his ministry in the mm -hmm. Quincy. Society <clears throat> and vestiges of the church were not open to include, you might say, the existential experience of blacks at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, how the story uh, begins with uh, Augustus Tolton. And was his mother still living when he came back as a priest? Yes, she was. Yes. She was. In fact, um, we had a celebration for her 100th anniversary of her death here in Chicago in uh, November. She's buried here in Chicago. I see. And, and did he end up, did he stay in Quincy, Illinois, or did he end up going to Chicago, or what, where, where did he end up after that? Things got kind of bad in Quincy. Uh, there was one particular priest who was his nemesis there in Quincy, who kind of frequently went to the bishop complaining about Tolton, and that uh, whites were attending his masses, and he accused Tolton of somehow <laughs> organizing this. He was reprimanded by the bishop and told to stick with his own people. And if he couldn't get this together, it was best for him to leave. So this threw him into a quandary, and it didn't stop. Uh, and he began writing letters back to Rome, asking for permission to find some other bishop as his superior. And uh, given <laughs> the, the speed with which correspondences were exchanged, in those days, none of this happened quickly. Right, right. And in the midst of it, he was really suffering hardship because he was yes. isolated. Yes, yes. There was a Southern gentleman, Archbishop of Chicago, by the name of um, uh, Patrick Fian, who came to the rescue and invited Tolton then to come to Chicago in 1889 the week before Christmas and worked with a fledgling group of Blacks who were worshiping in a basement downtown Chicago. And so then he went to Chicago and um, worked with this, worked with this group. And, um, and, but he didn't, he, it seems to me he, he died at a fairly young age, didn't he? Yes, he did. After about a year or so, the Archbishop gave him permission to start plans for building a, a church for Blacks, oh. which turned out to be the first Catholic church for Black Catholics in Chicago. And it took a couple of years to get that going, raising funds and so forth. And then, I don't know if you know anything about Chicago, we do have the extremes of weather. Yes, we do. I do know that. <laughs> Either cold or heat. Right. And, um, the first week of July 1897, Chicago suffered one of its famous heat waves. We've had several of them in recent years, whereby people succumbed to the heat and they found they're found dead. Yeah. Uh, a lot of elderly and so forth who don't know necessarily what's going on outside. Their windows and doors are closed, kind of thing. And on this particular week of 1897, Father Toten was coming back from a spiritual retreat for priests in Bourbonnais, 
Illinois, and he got off of the 35th Street train station and had to walk 10 blocks to get to his rectory. But he's collapsed several feet away from the, the train station. And some area constables had uh, signaled some carriage or something to take him to the nearby hospital, Mercy Hospital ran by the Mercy Nuns. And they asked the sisters if they would take in this black man whom they found on the street. And the sisters looked at him and immediately recognized him because his parish, his church, St. Monica, was not very far away from the hospital. Okay. So they took him in and worked on him for about eight hours. Now that was July 9th. But by 8.30 that evening, he had succumbed to what was on his death certificate mentioned as heat stroke uh -huh. and complications of uremia. That complicated the situation for him. He was only 43. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so basically he worked himself to death, I mean, is what it, is, is what it sounds like, reading, reading between the lines. He was exhausted. There were those who reported seeing him kind of deteriorate for a while there. He had to sit down when he preached. Mm. Um, and then people in those days did not have standard health care as we understand it today. Right. Especially Blacks. Uh, people would create things in their kitchen to help with one or the other malady of this or that. But there were other things going on in those days, things like uh, tuberculosis and cardiac problems, uh, blood pressure problems, those kinds of things, which were never really tended to right. uh, professionally. And those things determined uh, a much shorter lifespan for many people. If you could get to 50 years of age, you were thought to be old, mm -hmm. Civil War period and thereafter. Yes, yes. If you look back at his life now, what aspects of his life do you think are particularly important and compelling for people in our time? I think uh, Tolton shows us how to handle disappointment in life. Uh, not just disappointment, you might say protracted disappointments. Yes. That life throws at us while relying upon God to get us through certain things. The word no was thrown at Tolton more often than not throughout his life, ever since he was a boy. Uh, life does not always deal us a good set of cards. Uh, as Christians, as Catholics, uh, especially, we look to the saints to show us how to navigate the hard times and enjoy even the joys that life sometimes also gives us. But Father Tolton's um, disposition, I believe, inspires. It also motivates and is a reminder that God has a plan for all of us, no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in. If we can find truth and strength in the message and the counsel of the gospel, uh, we end up in the Lord's arms, I believe, as Tolton did. So let's talk now a little bit about why you think he's a saint and what it means to be a saint in the Catholic Church. Maybe we should start with that because that's probably not obvious to people, you know, when, when we say someone's been canonized, what exactly does that mean? What are we saying? I mean, you just now said, I believe he's in the Lord's arms. Naming someone a saint is the highest citation the church can give us Christian. Um, we're not talking about um, celebrities or, or famous people who did great things in life. We're not talking about necessarily historical personages. Those are all fine. We're not talking about people who won Oscars or the Golden Globe Awards or that kind of thing. Uh, a sainthood points to one thing about a person, that they took the gospel of Jesus and lived it with heroic seriousness within the circumstances in which they found themselves. That and only that. Uh, some people were able to get through life's ups and downs and died natural deaths. Others of them were had their bodies ripped apart because they were Christian, because they were Catholic, or they were members of the church. We call them martyrs. Uh, somehow the awesomeness of the God we worship shone through them. Yes. 
Yes. And <clears throat> from the collective uh, inspiration of the people in the pews, so to speak, a recommendation is made to the bishops of the church. Hey, this person is worth imitating. They, they, they had some secret to living life well. Most of the saints suffered in life. We have mm -hmm. to say that. Uh, life was not peaches and cream for them. Uh, the image of the Lord's cross was, was somehow embedded upon their existence. So that's whom we're talking about when we, we name someone a saint. Uh, if so named, uh, their names can be added to our worship calendar. Their names can be enunciated within worship. And they are presented to the whole Catholic world as worthy of, of imitation and somehow having the map of how to get to heaven. Right, right. So, so <clears throat> you know, you and I maybe think our grandparents are in heaven or something like that, but we can't sure. build a church that says John Roback, St. John Roback. I mean, I, I pri yeah. privately I've canonized him, but I can't build yeah. a church or mention him in mass or, you know, anything like that. This exactly. is a... This is a statement on the part of the of, of the official church exactly. um, that this person is recognized for their heroic sanctity, and um, and there's a whole process to to declare that. So the first step is you got to investigate the guy and make sure he doesn't have anything that he really was a, a holy person. Um, but then there are other steps as well. So walk people through the process and let, and let's see where Father Tolton lies in this process of uh, of canonization. Well, only the, the Pope um, authorizes the title saint to be applied to a person's name uh, once these normative procedures for a rather rigorous investigation and research into the person's life are completed. The only thing I can um, compare it to would be doing a doctoral dissertation on someone's life, for which there are too many footnotes. <laughs> because... Um, the church is not interested in folklore or legend or anything that's fanciful. The church right. is only facts about a person's life. Right. Uh, uh, a bishop or a group of Catholics, uh, a religious order of women or men can make application for the process on behalf of someone who has been deceased at least five years before the process can can even be begun. Uh, given the green light to begin the research, uh, the person is, is dubbed a servant of God, and historical commission is appointed to overseeing the research into the facts of a person's life. And once the dossier is scrutinized and approved by church authorities at the Vatican, the candidate can be accorded the title venerable. And that is what Father Tolton is today. He is titled in the Catholic Church, Venerable Father Augustus Tolton. And that's when the Pope decrees that the person certainly lived a life of heroic virtue. Then next, in order to be titled a blessed, blessed Augustus Tolton, one miracle acquired through a candidate's intercession is required. It signals heaven's approval of this individual. A miracle is not required if a person was killed for their faith in Christ or their membership in the church or for reasons of hatred of the church. But a miracle is also required to be canonized a saint and therefore approved for universal recognition, worldwide veneration. My miracle, uh, the church understands that some turnaround of health that medical science is at a loss to explain occurred for someone after prayer to God offered using the name of the candidate. That's essential in a nutshell how the process goes. Yes, and so just to be clear for our non-Catholic uh, followers, we're not saying that Father Tolton does the miracle. God does the miracle. It's always yeah. God doing the miracle through the hands or intercession right. of the of the individual in question. So even in the Acts of the Apostles, when um, when Saint Peter does a miracle, Saint Peter's the first to t to say, "I didn't do it." 
Correct. Jesus did it. You know, so just to be 100 percent clear that, right. that, that, that that's what we're talking about. So when we speak to the saints, we're asking for their intercession. Mm -hmm. that, that's how that's how that works. We're not asking uh, them to do magic or something like that. We're asking them to intercede for God with God for this particular cause. Um, so, so tell people a little bit about the process of establish, uh, of establishing a medical cure, an unexplained medical cure. W what's the process? So it's the inexplicability, which is the, the norm. Uh, inexplicable occurrences approved most often by the church authorities have to do with the phenomena of cures that medicine had no role in providing. So we're studying a person's medical records and testimonies taken from physicians to meet the requirements of inexplicability. These are required. In addition, a review panel of physicians, usually there are five of them in Rome, are also called to the examination, plus testimony regarding the path and the frequency of prayer and those involved in this intercessory prayer are, is also required. We need those documents, <laughs> right, those right. medical records, right, in order to uh, explain it all for them. And first, you have to prove the person was really sick. Then you have to prove the person yeah. was really cured, and then exactly. you have to prove that not, that there was no explanation for it in between. Exactly, you're right. Right, right. Exactly. Okay. So, are you in a position to say are there any mir miracles um, alleged at this time, or, or reported, or anything under investigation at this time? No, we have, we've sent a couple medical phenomena over. One is still being looked at. Into. I see. I see. Very now, well. He's, he's just still venerable. I see. I see. Hmm? Well, um, but his life presents to us examples of, of heroic sanctity, living, living with, of heroic virtue. Is there anything you can say to our Ruth Institute followers about family and the importance of family life for him? Because this is our particular mission, you know, is to defend the family and to defend <clears throat> traditional <throat> Christian sexual morality and everything that's involved in that. And it sounds like his father and mother were, were um, heroically loyal people yes. you know, from, from your description of them. So tell us a little yes. bit about that. Family life for blacks who were enslaved was extremely difficult. Um, you lived under the specter of your slave master deciding one day that he needs to pay some bills. So he needs to sell off a person or two in order to keep things going for himself. Augustus's mother, Martha Jane, was already given away as a wedding gift to Stephen and Savilla Elliot, who were newlyweds. And this was happened in Kentucky. And um, they moved to Missouri for this plot of land that they purchased to work as a farm. After um, Martha Jane was given away like that, she never saw her parents again. Wow. Augustus and uh, Matilda Chisley. Uh, Augustus Tolton is named after his maternal grandfather. She never saw them again. And the reason why Martha Jane escaped the Elliots to begin with it was because this guy, Elliot, died without a will. And there were these dealers coming around the farm looking at equipment and stuff that his wife was willing to sell off in order to pay off his indebtedness. And naturally, a mother feared that her kids either would be taken away from her or she from them. And she had already gone through this wretched experience of a family breakup. And that's why she escaped. And by that time, the father had already gone to fight. Yeah, exactly. And did he ever come back? Did they ever see him again? She found his name on the list of Civil War casualties about seven years later. I see. Yeah. I see. He was uh, somehow in some anonymous grave in Arkansas where he died. I see. It, uh, I see. Union dispensary. And, and so she, her motivation to escape was to keep her little family together exactly. because she, she knew she couldn't count on her husband because he was, he was gone doing something else, which was obviously, uh, obvi I want to say something on this point because father absence is something we talk about in modern times. Mm -hmm. Augustus Tolton's father was absent from the mm -hmm. home, but he was still part of the family. 
Yes. You know, he hadn't he hadn't abandoned the family or been kicked out of the family or taken up with a new woman. Mm -hmm. He was still a revered part of the family. Yes, he was. And she was hoping for his return until, you know, that awful moment or day when she found that her husband was on a list of the deceased. Yes, yes. And um, if we look beyond uh, Father Tolton's life itself, beyond his life, one of the phenomenon that we do know happened is that after the Emancipation Proclamation, many Blacks went around looking for their relatives that they had been separated from. So the, the value mm -hmm. of family was very strong, mm -hmm. precisely because it had been disrupted, and mm -hmm. they knew what disruption meant to the family. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so in, in your experience, you have, you know, your personal experience, your pastoral experience, now your historical study of this. A lot of times we think of, of African-American families as being less stable than others. And when we look at the data, we know that poor people generally in the United States have lower rates of family formation, uh, higher rates of family breakdown, all of those kind of things that we that we talk about. But that's a relatively recent phenomenon uh, for, for that to be in, in a historical sense, you know, to look to take the longer view of just prior to the last five minutes or something that this is a new thing. Um, can you tell us something about that from a historical perspective or perhaps perhaps a pastoral uh, perspective of, of people that you've observed of of family, the, the value of family? Uh, within the African American community, both historically and and currently, there are certain things that are carried on. I think from generation to generation, and the denunciation, the negation of the black experience, particularly the black man, did not bode well for family life. Most African Americans have a tough enough time tracing their lineage back to their great-grandparents <clears throat> because of this routine denial of the dignity of, of the human person. Mm -hmm. uh, when slaves were brought here, they were forced to uh, deny their, their, their African names, their African religions. Um, there was no recording of them. Uh, there's... There's a cemetery on either side of the church where, where Tolton was baptized as a baby. One is uh, a cemetery for the area farmers and that with their handsome gravestones and so forth. And the other side of the church is a cemetery for slaves. There are no markers there. Wow. No names mentioned. No names. No names. Wow. It, it indicates how <laughs> these people were treated denunciated, marginalized, and considered to be non-persons. Right. You don't do that to a human being and expect him to be able to take care of his family when he does not have the self-esteem or the recognition or the resources with which to carry on a family. It's just impossible. Now, where do you pick that up from? How do you learn that? Well, if this is repeated after century after century after century, then of course for us, you know, slavery lasted 400 some years. Then it didn't end. England ended their enslavement of peoples in 1807. But for us, it continued. It morphed into segregation and discrimination where the black man was again denied his dignity. Where is he going to pick up the resources, let alone the understanding of taking care of himself and, his, and a family, mm -hmm. when society will not allow him to do that? Mm -hmm. See, it's repetitive, and it's quite nefarious, if not satanic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and we see this now amongst uh, many poor peoples uh, yes. in, in the in around the United the States. Uh, yes, yes, around around the world. <clears throat> yes, yes. yes. Um, and so, do you have any um, any thoughts about how we can help one another strengthen our families, whatever our circumstances may be? Are there public policies that you would um, th think would be appropriate or? or uh, personal policies, how people should interact with one another, perhaps differently than they are now? 
public policies certainly have a role. One's personal resolve certainly has a role. Um, I think public policies have to uh, allow people to, first of all, have dignity and self-esteem. I think our society has done that after a good deal of bloodshed with things like civil rights that opened up the ability for Blacks to get education, uh, to attend a school that also happened to be attended by whites, to have voting rights, uh, other kinds of freedom to move about, uh, to live where you want to, to live and have the ability to live, and so forth and so on. But all of that is not quite perfect. <laughs> right, right. Uh, there are still some things that we continue to see that somehow burst the closet doors open and some people who want to maintain things the way they've always been burst forth and utter some ugly things and act ugly. Again, the existential of the Black experience is not totally integrated within American society. There's a book written out by the um, Harvard sociologist Kahil Muhammad titled The Condemnation of Blackness. And it describes, it's a rather thick book. I, I was able to read it during COVID lockdown. We couldn't <laughs> do, much, do much else. But <clears throat> it's a remarkable thesis of how, when you consider the term social distancing, we in our country have been practicing social distancing amongst the races for an awful long time. And to make sure that social distance was maintained between white and black in American society, uh, we criminalized the black man. We executed him for things that he did not do, uh, stuff that still goes on today, how anyone can maintain a family in the midst of that kind of persecution is beyond me. No man can survive that, whether you're white or black, brown, Middle Eastern or whatever. Our country has not dealt a good deck of cards to the African-American man for as long as we've been around. And that's in every institution. Society, church, politics, you need it. So if, if, uh, if God willing, uh, Father Tolton is declared blessed, is declared a saint, what impact do you think that will have on these type of themes that you've been talking about in America? I, I look at it personally. Personally, I feel it would be a wonderful thing for the United States of America, if Father Tolton did something really big, if he gave us a really big miracle, you know, um, and he were canonized, that I feel like that would be a wonderful thing for the United States. But what do you think? Uh, it, it, am I am I exaggerating here? Well, not much. I, I <laughs> a little. Thing, this whole Maybe a little. Saint, sainthood thing is a thing that is peculiarly Catholic, right? Um, other Christians share with us uh, uh, a structure of sainthood and uh, an acknowledgement of heroic Christians in that. The Orthodox Church does as well. Uh, Protestant Church, much of that was eschewed with the uh, Reformation. Um, but I think his story needs to be told. I think he can be appreciated by African Americans for once. He was an African American. He was a citizen of our country. He was a citizen of Chicago and so forth. He was a Christian, most importantly, so I think people can understand aspects of his life in that vein. Uh, there are other Christians who are heroic in our society who are not necessarily named saints. Right. Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, uh, you name it. Uh, so in that sense, I think there is an impression. I don't know how many people out there would be jumping for joy once he's named a saint outside of the Catholic Church and uh, some vestiges of Eastern Christianity. Uh, but we'll see what happens. He's named blessed. Uh, 
we'll see what happens. All right. And, and, you know, you never know the impact of something like that because now we're not talking about sociology anymore. We're no. talking about, we're talking about the spiritual world. We're talking about spiritual combat. And exactly. I have no doubt at all that God has the capacity to take the worst thing you ever did and turn it into something good, you know, and to, to exactly. he's, he's, <clears throat> that's in fact the cross. I mean, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So I, I, uh, I'm, I personally will be very excited uh, if Father Sultan is um, is declared blessed, and I'm very pleased that you have per chosen to pursue him. Um, did you have to get authority from your bishop? Well, you are the bishop, but but you're an auxiliary bishop. So did you, on your own authority, move this uh, ball th forward, or how did how did that part of it work? No, this this all began with our previous Archbishop, uh, Cardinal Francis George, the late. Ah. Cardinal Francis George. Yes, I see. <clears throat> he read <clears throat> a biography of Tolton by Sister Caroline Hemesath that uh, was put out about 1973. And he was so moved by it, he made the remark to me one day, you know, I think I'm going to ask Rome to name him a saint for all we put him through. And it was just a quip of, of that nature. It, it didn't register with me at all. The next thing I knew, he had done some uh, initial uh, fact-finding on Tolton from different sources where he heard Tolton had been or stepped. And then there was a, a decree on my desk one day naming me as the postulator. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, what is that term? Postulator? Postulator, yeah. Postulator, it, okay. And that means, and what does that exactly mean, that you're the postulator? The overseer of the process. I, I see. I the the research and the theologians who study his life and so forth. I and see. Present that dossier to Rome. I see. And so there, and so there it was on your desk that all of a yes. sudden, there yeah. you are. The cardinal was very moved by it. In fact, in the cardinal's biography, he's he, there's a statement reported that he made, which is truly remarkable. He said, of his whole life as a bishop, uh, probably the most remarkable thing he's ever done was to ask Rome to consider Father Tolton a saint, which really is very touching. I think so, too. Very touching, yeah. Yeah, that's very powerful because it's recognizing that you don't know what God can do with a process like that or with a person like that. Like, where, yeah. where could such a thing go? It's, um, it, the possibilities are literally infinite Sure. when, when you sure. look at it that way. I mean, think about a parade down the streets of Chicago on St. Tolton's feast day. <laughs> right? Yes. Right? I mean, it could happen. Right? Uh, and, and yeah, <laughs> I mean, oh, many I'm things impressed. could happen. <clears throat> yes, indeed. What, what day did he die? You, I think you mentioned the date that he died. July 9th, 1897. Okay, so generally speaking, the, the next isn't that day, the day that you die, proposed at least as the feast day for a person? It's usually the person's date of death if we know it. Yeah. Yes, if we know it. Yeah, so, yeah. So there are many possibilities here. So, um, Your Excellency, do you have any final words that you'd like to say to the Ruth Institute followers, to our, our interfaith coalition of uh, advocates for traditional Christian sexual morality? Do you have any last words for us? I would say this, <clears throat> regardless of your, your religious persuasion, especially your Christian uh, persuasion, uh, the saints uh, speak uh, clearly to us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is possible for us. Uh, this is not Aesop's fairy tales. These are real stories of people who lived Jesus in their lives. And God desires that we, we somehow reflect him in life and all of life's circumstances. And this is what we mean by holiness of life. Uh, baptism sets you on this journey of holiness of life. And, the, and a person like Father Tolton, him specifically, he, he lived a life of, of, of deep faith, humility, and perseverance. He doesn't speak to everyone. There are other people, there are many ways in which to attack racism in our society. Father had his own way. He yes. stood alone. There were no structures, organizations, or that kind of thing that came to his rescue or came to the rescue of blacks in general. I mean, this went on for a couple hundred years more until we had anything uh, smacking of, uh, civil rights. 
but Tolton was a Christian in his manner. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. He carried the daily crosses of racial negation, and discrimination, race prejudice, and outright hatred. How do you live with that and survive? Anyone, white, black, brown, Middle Eastern. But remarkably, through it all, he remained open to both black and white in his ministry and showed himself an instrument of reconciliation and human dignity. He was dedicated to leading others to God, which is the ultimate definition of being a priest. Regardless of their background, and people responded to his kindness and gentle manner. But they underwent his denunciation like he did, if they were so inclined. He's credible as a hero, as a Christian hero, such that no matter how ordinary that we think we are, we can all overcome certain odds in order to do good things for God. If not extraordinary things to live life as good Christians. I think that's the message of uh, an Augustus Tolton. And I hope the church will eventually recognize that and that heaven will endorse it. And then, as you say, do a parade down the street once he is named a saint of our Christian faith. Well, thank you very much for that. And can you tell people how they can get involved uh, and learn more about Father Tolton, first of all? And second of all, can people be involved in some way in helping? Sure. We do have a website, uh, tolton.archchicago.org, or you can just Google Augustus Tolton and everything will come up. That's right. The extant uh, pictures of him, photographs of him that have survived. Uh, we keep our website pretty dated regarding activities and uh, documentaries and things related to him. All our newsletters are put on our website and announcements about our uh, pilgrimages to the place where he was a slave and where he worked here and in Quincy and his gravesite. So all of that is, 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 is kept fresh as far as possible. Um, if someone is so inclined, they can uh, donate to the details of our office expenses with all of the correspondence that we do and sending uh, prayer cards and pictures of Tolton out to kids in our schools and that to uh, describe his story to them. Um, and uh, we, in, we speak to audiences pretty regularly around the country, various types regarding his position as a historical figure in the African-American saga, uh, as well as his, his uh, figure in the church. We do that pretty regularly. We uh, like to see people participate in that, learn more about him, and spread his story around. Those are the essential ways right now while we're working or waiting for a miracle for him to be named blessed. Well, that's, uh, that's enough. I mean, you know, and that, that gives people an idea of, of what's available to them. And mm -hmm. I would say if, if you're Catholic and you can do so in good conscience, you can chat it up with Father Tolton, you know, uh, uh, yeah. pr pr talk with him. I, I always have to be sure our non-Catholic friends understand we're not praying to them in the sense of worshiping them. We're yeah. praying to them in the sense of talking to our brothers and sisters who just happen not to be alive right now. Sure. Uh, but. But if you if you do chat it up with Father Tolton and he does something for you, please be sure to tell Bishop Perry about it. Also on our website, we do have a bibliography of the latest. Uh, there are several books and pamphlets we publish or have been published on his life for those who are interested in a more in-depth uh, examination of his life and some of the things we've talked about today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Bishop Joseph Perry, thank you so much for being my guest today on this episode of the Dr. J Show. I think this is going to be a very special episode that people are going to come back to again and again. Thank you, Doctor, for your interest in Tolton. Blessings to all who have been listening today. Thank you.